Hey everybody, welcome to Business Makers. I'm your host, Matthew Weimer. Today's guest is Joseph Lewin. Joseph Lewin is the Director of Growth for Proofpoint Marketing, where he is responsible for cultivating opportunities to build valuable relationships with the ideal fit clients. Within that, he produces several shows, creates company content, and develops relationships with potential customers. As well as his work with Proofpoint, Joseph is the director of Wawiza Movement. Wawiza, Did I get yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, okay. An organization based in Kakamega. There you go. <laughs> All you right, Kenya. Uh, the Wawiza Movement mission is to rescue, restore, and develop the least and the forgotten. He is a homesteader, homeschooling dad living here in Cincinnati and his wife with and four kids. They're four kids, right? Yep, four kids. All right. Welcome, Joseph. Uh, glad to have you on the show. Thank you for your time, man. Yeah, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on. Really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So you work for Proofpoint and I, one, I'm, I'm, a big fan of the content you guys have been putting out with the outbound podcast, but I've also uh, fallen in love with the website. I've uh, I've like gone through like the about and like the journey, like the journey, like it's an incredible story. If you guys want to go to uh, their website, I'll put it in the link, but uh, and it's an incredible story how Mike and Gabby got started, but you're the director of growth. And how did you, get started were you always into marketing uh what what has that journey been like for you yeah i mean when you were describing the show <laughs> and who the audience is for i i think that uh my story will probably be relevant um i've always struggled with how to tell the story in a concise way so i'll i'll keep it concise and then you can uh dig into it more if you want to but sure. um i was homeschooled and um I really struggled to learn how to read. Like I basically couldn't read at anywhere close to grade level when I, um, you know, until I was probably 18 and, and, you know, then I was starting to become a better reader at that point. Um, but it really hurt my scholastic experience because I, um, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. So I, I just really struggled with, um, anything academic related. Um, so then getting out of high school, it was like, what, what in the world am I going to do? <laughs> I had spent a couple of years in high school building decks and doing construction work. Um, and then I started working for a company doing installing security cameras. And I did that till I was 21. Um, and then my wife and I uh, started doing long distance relationships. She, I was living in Denver. She's from Cincinnati. So when we were getting ready to get married, I moved out to Cincinnati and started working for her cousin sweeping chimneys. And so that was a very manual labor nice. <laughs> intensive job. Uh, you know, micros, dirty jobs. I think chimney sweeping has got to be <laughs> up yeah. there. I'd get home like totally black from head to toe <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> every single day. Like you shower and it's just like black soot coming out of your hair. And <laughs> see when you watch, <laughs> when you watch Mary Poppins, like when you watch the, like it, it, it probably brings back traumatic, like, like yeah, it's, memories yeah. it's stressful i'm not gonna lie yeah, yeah. <laughs> not something you normally say about mary poppins right um yeah but i'd always done photography and video and so you know i had a mark for content uh, a uh a knack is what i meant to say for content creation but i was kind of stuck in this manual labor world um and then you had mentioned while ways of movement the work we're doing in kenya so in back in 2014 i started taking photos and videos to help get sponsorship for kids in our program in Kenya. Um, and then that kind of led my wife and I did some uh, traveling internationally after that. So we ended up trading photos and videos in exchange for staying at hotels, like high end hotels and stuff like that. Um, cool. And that led into doing product trade. So we got like this $4,000 organic mattress and a, and a sauna and all this stuff. So we just started getting this portfolio of, video content. Um, and then I realized, man, if people are willing to trade product, maybe they'd be willing to actually pay me for it. So that kind of launched me into a marketing business where I was doing just about anything in marketing. I started building websites and working on marketing strategy. 
Um, yeah, and I said I'd make it the short version. So basically, that kind of led led me to uh, end up getting a an official marketing role at my previous company as a product marketing manager, uh, and I basically used my portfolio of you know work that I'd done for some clients to land an official job, um, and then I ended up starting a podcast while I was working there called the Strategic Marketer, where I interviewed super smart marketing people, and one of those super smart people uh, was was Mike. Grinberg, my now boss, um, and that led to our, um, to me becoming a director of demand generation. I was working on client accounts, and then I recently moved to director of growth here, um, focusing on podcasts and shows and things like that. So, uh, definitely nice. have a very uh, windy path to any that's where I'm at today. But yeah, um, yeah, it's been fun. Very cool. So yeah, like it sounds like. Um your time traveling was a little bit of a boot camp kind of in that trading value. Like um, what other things is, I mean, I feel like that, that travel has to probably build some certain like skill sets in you um, that you, you have with you now in your tool chest. Yeah. I mean, definitely just recognizing that when you provide something uh, I actually just, read the go giver. Um, mm. and he talks about how you need to give more value than you take in payment. And that's kind of the, the first law of the go giver. And I think that's a really great way to, to say it, you know, is learning how to find something that people really need that's valuable and then mm -hmm. giving them more value than you're taking in payment. Um, and if you, especially if you're trying to break into a new field or a new industry, I think that concept is really important. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, don't short sell yourself. Don't give away anything for free. But it's like you're in a sense, you're not really giving something away for free if you're just starting out. If you've been doing something for years and you have a lot of value and then you're giving a bunch of stuff away for free for like future opportunity, you mm -hmm. can start to get really taken advantage of. But if you're trying to make that transition and you've, you know, you're breaking into say marketing, you know, we'll just use marketing as an example, doing things for free, you do get value out of that because you get a real case study that you can use out of that to land your next client or, you know, land a job or whatever that next step is that you're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, just learning where that value versus payment uh, lies is definitely something that I learned while we were traveling and, and uh, exchanging stays for content. Yeah. So um, one of the things that really struck, strikes me about proof point is this idea that there was kind of a line in the sand moment for Mike and Gabby, where it was like, they realized we want to be about relationships. And one of the things I, I noticed is you, you guys have this uh, relationship led framework. You, could you tell us a little bit more about that framework and, and how it's um, been a, a resource for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I would say one one way to describe it is that when people are thinking about marketing, most of the time they're thinking about things that would be more brand awareness. Like you're just letting people know that you exist and hoping that they'll fill out a form and when they're ready to buy and reach out to you. And if you sell software, that model might work. <laughs> it depends on mm -hmm. how expensive your software is. But if you're selling anything that has significant value to it, you know, talking about $10,000 plus. And for a lot of our clients, they're selling consulting, which is going to be a hundred to a million dollar engagement, usually a hundred thousand to a million dollar engagement. So um, expecting people to fill out a form on your website to buy a million dollars worth of consulting from you is a total pipe dream. I mean, that doesn't really happen very often. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you have to really think about what is the buying journey for people on the other side? And for us, we have really honed in on serving consulting companies and professional services companies. So what they're selling isn't a product. It's not coming mm -hmm. in to sell so a software solution or you know radar or security system or something like that. We're coming in to sell, uh, or our clients are coming in to sell themselves. They're selling their ability as an organization to bring change inside of another organization. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to build trust with the people on the other side. And so if you're thinking that people just seeing the name of your company 
pop up here and there is going to be enough to drive that level of trust to where they go, hey, I'm willing to put my career on the line to bring you in because I've seen your company logo pop up a couple times on my feed. Uh, mm -hmm. It helps, but that's not enough. You really have to figure out how do you get one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and build relationships. So the relationship-led growth uh, framework is really, uh, it's you know essentially this flywheel where people don't buy from companies and they don't build affinity with companies. They they build affinity and buy from people. And so there's you know the the inside of the circle of this flywheel is alignment. So you really need to get alignment internally between your sales team or business development, your marketing team, and your leadership. And that alignment needs to be on who your ideal customers are, what your messaging is, exactly what your services do and the value they bring, the main pain points and problems of your customers, and then what your go-to market strategy is. And if you don't have that level of alignment at the center, there's no way that you're going to be able to consistently build those deep relationships across the organization. Now, you might have a couple people at your company that are really good at building relationships and they're going to drive most of the business development. Mm -hmm. But if you want to scale, you really need to figure out how to get that same level of relationship building across the organization. Um, so then the, the second layer uh, in that flywheel is going to be people, ideas, and groups. And so you're really building affinity, not with the brand as a whole, but as the people, the ideas, and the groups um, that that company represents. And so then when we're thinking about creating content, it's really focusing on those, those three areas. Like how do we create content that helps us start conversations and you know get in with conversations that are already happening in the groups, share mm -hmm. our unique point of view, which is the ideas. And then the people is, you know, how do we get the people on our team to build one-on-one -on -one relationships with decision makers and you know people who are influential inside of organizations? And when you get all three of those things working together and your team is aligned around making those things happen, that's where you're really going to get um, you know, a multi uh, multiplier effect. Um, yeah, that's where you're going to really get that multiplier effect of, of the effort that you're putting in. Nice. So um, with, with Proofpoint, um, as you came into the company, how, what, what was the alignment journey like for you? Like, uh, it seems like a pretty tight knit group. Um, I saw that you guys do like, uh, retreats to like Arizona. Um, well, yeah. What was that, that like, uh, kind of capturing, like capturing the vision of what Mike and Gabby were doing and was it, was it a quick kind of, um, uh, like, uh, calibration or yeah that's a good question i'm trying to think of the best way to to answer that because it's a it's a really good question i would say that the alignment to be successful alignment really has to come from the leadership team and that doesn't mean that your leadership team and in my case that's mike and gabby doesn't mean that they have all the answers mm -hmm. it means that they're looking to serve their customers and build a team that is unified. And one of the main focuses for Proofpoint uh, existing, you know, obviously we're serving clients, we want to see them succeed. But one of the driving factors for Mike and Gabby was to have a people first organization so that, you know, the things that happened to them in their roles um, were basically they were treated like a commodity and like a transaction rather than like valuable members of the team. So, you know, when they had something significant happened in their life where their daughter was born very premature, the way that they were treated by, you know, especially Gabby, by the company she was working for was horrendous, you know, so mm -hmm. they've done an amazing job at building the company culture internally. Um, and that's really been a driving factor for them. So coming in, um, I definitely experienced that. And then the longer that I'm here, the more I see Mike and Gabby being amazing leaders, you know, being open and transparent. Uh, they definitely have their ideas and their point of view, but they've opened the door for those of us on the team um, to really add our own value and add our own perspective. And so the alignment piece is something that we've been working towards because I, I think one kind of mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to marketing and sales is you have a good idea and then you're just going to run with it to the end. But 
the marketing and sales that I've seen that are most successful are when you have a hypothesis and then you go to try to prove it wrong. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. you keep doing that until you can't prove it wrong anymore. Um, so the process of, that we've gone through with alignment internally is really honing in on who are our ideal customers. And we've kind of shifted our focus because we were doing much broader. When I started, we were focusing on a much broader audience, just kind of B2B in general. So we had some mm -hmm. software people that we'd worked with and some manufacturing and some professional services and consulting. So we are kind of serving a really broad group of people. So part of the alignment has been, you know, us internally figuring that out and getting aligned as we go along on, okay, who are we serving? Then once we honed in and go, okay, the people who we really are able to serve the best are in professional services and consulting. Then we've started to identify, okay, what are the main pain points and problems that they're experiencing? And the issue of aligning internally is huge at professional services companies. A lot of them uh, kind of grow through their leadership team or their partners doing most of the selling. They get to a certain point in scale and they can't continue doing that. So then mm -hmm. they have to figure out a way to bring in marketing in a way they never have before. And mm -hmm. usually that marketing is coming in from a very tactical level, but they really need somebody on their team or a fractional leader, which is kind of the position that we were coming in in their organization to drive marketing strategy. And you have to have that alignment between you know the marketing strategy, your business development and your leadership team. Um, but we've really honed in on that over the last six to eight months and recognizing that. So anyway, I'm, I'm sharing all that yeah. to say that alignment piece, we were aligned internally as a group of what are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. But then to really get that alignment, you need leadership and the different leaders in, in your team and even people who aren't leaders to come together and bring their perspective. And I think your leadership team really has to be open to being wrong about their hypothesis and their assumptions if you're going to truly get alignment and you know you're hiring great people so you need to trust them to bring their perspective in but then the leadership team has to ultimately make the decision and say okay we've gotten the input from everybody this is what we're going to run with and what we're going to test mm -hmm. and you know then it's in that testing over and over again that you truly get to that level of alignment because you start seeing things move and you start seeing things work uh, and then you can kind of focus in on okay what has worked and we're going to really lean into that um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, so I noticed with your, with your role, I love how you guys have kind of like a little tree of, of the, the organization. Um, I noticed that for you there, that you kind of have your own little branch. Um, what is there, is there any like crossover or any kind of like, I mean, I, obviously I'm sure if you, you know, you have team meetings, like you, you, yeah, you'll you'll know uh, you'll you'll say hi to you know somebody in, a, in another branch or whatever. But uh, is there any crossover or what is that like? Kind of being kind of isolated over over here, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know if that question makes sense or not. No, it, it makes a ton of sense. That's been something that you know. There's you kind of go through ebbs and flows of the size of company because we're a pretty small company. So mm -hmm. eventually my role will have a team that will be working, um, working on this stuff together. So, you know, eventually there will be, you know, kind of more, more of a team, but at the moment it's me. And then I'm working directly with our CEO. So our CEO, Mike is also doing business development and he does content creation and stuff like that also. So, you know, he and I work really closely together, but it has been something that we've, we've been working on solving where there have been seasons over the last year where I am heads down working on stuff that I'm working on. And then, you know, if we're not really intentional about creating those connection points with other people on the team, it's not necessarily a problem in, in the moment, but it becomes a problem if it's been a couple of weeks or a month and there's other people on the team that I haven't really interfaced with. Mm -hmm. And that really becomes apparent if there's some kind of an issue that happens, you know, either something happens with somebody else or I do something that rubs somebody the wrong way or whatever the situation would be. That's when you start going, uh, Oh man, <laughs> like that connection becomes really important because if you haven't yeah. had connection with other people on the team, like one-on-one -on -one or, you know, even in a group setting 
or you're having non-work conversations with people, then you you can lose the benefit of the doubt that you get to somebody that you you know have that tight connection with. So, you know, especially over the last three or four months, because I'm not the only one that's in a role that's a little bit more isolated like that. Like we have now multiple people who are really focused on a specific department role and less on client work. Um, so in that case, we've had to really figure out how to be more intentional about that. So um, we really try to limit meetings because we're a remote remote company. And if you're not careful, you'll just be stacked in meetings all day, every day. Mm -hmm. But then there's kind of yeah. this interesting balance where if you get rid of too many meetings, yes, it's more efficient and everybody's time is more flexible, but you lose those connection points. So um, one thing that we're testing out that, we, that we've just started recently is having a 45 minute block on uh, one day a week. That's just like optional, but it's coffee with your colleagues. And if you're free and you're available, then you just jump on and it's more water cooler type conversations. Like we're not focusing on work or, you know, anything that's going on. It's just, Hey, you know, what's going on in your life? How are the kids? You know, what's up? Yeah. And it's amazing how far something like that goes to build, build that connection. And I think that's really easy to overlook when you're trying to create efficiency in your business, that human element and human connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how is it uh is it is is most of the the group uh remote or yeah i mean we're a fully remote fully remote company so yeah we have so that's got to be in california super, florida yeah so that's got to be really important to like create those connections and create like those those opportunities like where you guys can can uh yeah, get get that synergy that you need. Um, with the podcast, uh, you have outbound. So was that kind of a was that a brainchild between you, Mike, or was that uh, kind of something that you kind of saw like after doing the previous podcast? So yeah, I was running the strategic marketer for a while, um, and just with all the things we had going on at work, that's kind of slowed slowed down uh being able to produce that uh, but then we like you know like i was talking about where we're, where it's taken time for us to get that internal alignment and i don't think there's any i don't think there's any way around that no matter where you're at in your organization if you're going to truly get alignment you need to make a hypothesis like i said and, and run after mm -hmm. it so last year we were focusing a lot more on marketers and marketing leaders within companies and part way through the year um I had talked to a bunch of people that were in the marketing roles that we would normally sell into. And they're all like, Hey, I've basically been told I can't spend any other, any, any more money this year. And I heard that, I don't know, probably 10 times <laughs> in conversations over the course of a month, uh, a month or two. And just with where things were going in the economy, marketing is usually the first, uh, it gets cuts a lot earlier than sales does. Mm -hmm. um, and if the sales team, is able to show that what they're doing is bringing a new business and pipeline, they can usually get budget approval for something. Whereas marketing, it's a lot more difficult to do that. Um, so at that point in the year is, you know, around July, started to go, hey, I think we need to make a pivot and start going after salespeople more. And so I just started talking with salespeople and recognizing for one, that we could bring value to these organizations much faster if we're connected with the sales team. Number two, with clients that have been successful, we've been able to get buy-in from the sales team and interact with the marketing team and the sales team. And then companies where we've really struggled to uh, to prove out the value of what we're doing, it's usually because either the marketing team is blocking access to the sales team or the sales team isn't really interested in in participating in what's going on um, you know, from the campaigns that we're working on. And so... You know, for both of those reasons, it was like, hey, we need to get buy-in from sales anyway, and marketing mm -hmm. doesn't have any budget. So, you know, why don't we start reaching out to salespeople? And yeah, through conversations really confirmed that going in through sales and having more of a focus on on working with the sales team from the beginning um, proved to be true. So that's where mm. the Outbound podcast came from, um, you know, having focused a lot of my time and relationships on building relationships with marketing people. 
now it's like, okay, well, there's this whole other group of people that I need to build relationship with and have basically zero <laughs> relationship with them. So, yeah. you know, just trying to cold call or cold outreach to a ton of salespeople and try to sell them on our services is not super effective. <laughs> so yeah. uh, then the podcast has really provided uh, a platform to be able to build relationships with people in sales and make those connections. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of going back to mentioning the go-giver, taking that same mindset where we're going, hey, this isn't, I'm not going in trying to just sell everybody that comes onto the podcast or everybody I come into contact with. It's, mm -hmm. I'm going to provide more value than I'm asking for by giving salespeople a platform, letting them share their ideas and expertise, mm -hmm. making them look good to their boss, to their peers, you know, and, and giving them a platform. And then sometimes it makes sense to initiate a sales conversation, depending on the situation, you know, probably 20, 25% of the time they initiate a sales conversation by going, Hey, what do you guys do at Proofpoint? Tell me more about that. And then the rest of the time, it's really just looking for ways to continue to add value to those people and continue the conversation with them. Um, and then, you know, you're nurturing those relationships and some of them are going to come back when they're ready or, you know, they're open to making an introduction to somebody else who is ready to buy. Um, so that's kind of where that podcast uh, originated from. Cool. Yeah. I, I love, like I've been, I, I, I've really been this year digging into LinkedIn because it, it was at first, I think for like a sole entrepreneur like myself, it kind of scared me away for a while because there was this like corporate kind of vibe to it. And I've been digging in this year and your, your podcast is kind of one of the first things that's like popped up on my feed. And, uh, it's been, it's been really fun to, uh, watch the episodes and, and dig into that. Uh, and I, I love the trailer that you recently released. Um, uh, for those that haven't seen it, he, He's out in his, uh, you have uh, four acres. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I've got yeah. a couple acres of wood. Yeah. Woods in and the back. he's back there with a machete. Uh, I didn't know if those were real machete sounds or did you, did you add those in? Uh... No, I, I added those in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but the idea that you were talking about was this idea of like kind of paving a new path and that sales is broken. Uh, what what about because i i feel it and I, I i i feel like when i'm talking with my other peers like i i'm seeing it as well that there's something wrong with the way we've been doing sales and marketing for so long and what what about sales is broken i think the best way to say it is you have to make it about the customer you have to make it about the other person. And uh, I, I, I know I keep bringing up The Go-Giver, but I think it's a, good, it's a great book to illustrate what I'm talking about. So if you haven't read it, um, I'm going to be interviewing. I was supposed to interview Bob on my show earlier today. Oh, and then um, oh We man. had this thunderstorm. <laughs> knocked out the power right uh. before. So he was gracious enough to reschedule. But, you know, Bob is the author of The Go-Giver. And, you know, just after reading through the book, I think, that, I think that's a great book to read to kind of get the idea of, what I'm talking about. And it's really ultimately, um, if you're going to create a, uh, a business that's successful or you're going to be successful in sales or marketing, you know, any way you look at it, if you approach the market where you're just trying to extract as much as you can with as little effort and as, and as little value as you can for the other side and, you know, really focusing on efficiency, um, you're not going to build the high quality relationships that are going to keep giving back to you over and over again. So, you know, you might get like, if you cold call a thousand people, will you close some business for sure? But the people who are going to be open to working with you after cold calling, they're going to typically be the kinds of people that want to cut pricing. You know, they're, they're going to be a more tra transactional relationship to begin with. Whereas if you built that relationship from the beginning on adding significantly more value from the very first conversation, then you're taking in payment, whether that's, you know, dollars or, or time, you know, if somebody's going to invest 15 minutes with you or a half hour or an hour, are they going to get more value from that conversation than, than the 15 minutes or 30 minutes or hour that they spent? And for a lot of sales, the focus is really on how can I increase my pipeline? How can I grow my business? How can I get more sales? 
Um, and then, you know, really treating the person on the other side who hasn't even worked with you before, like they're a commodity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the one side, sales is a numbers game. And so there's always going to be the element to where you have to have a lot of activity and you're not going to hit every single time. And you're probably going to bother somebody at some point <laughs> if you're going to sell it and be any good at it. So, you know, there's definitely a balance there. I think coming from a marketing background, we can be a little bit more um, uh, idealistic about <laughs> how sales actually works. But if you got to close business, you know, at a certain point, you, you do have to sell people and, you know, you got to, you got to um, make the ask and stuff like that, that a lot of marketers are a little bit more hesitant to do. But at the same time, you have to figure out how to make it about them. Uh, and that's where I feel like sales and marketing also are broken. I mean, this week, I've been added to probably four email newsletters from companies I've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And they're just probably scraping my information from a company like Zoom Info or they're, you know, I've never given Zoom Info permission to take my, yeah. my information, but they're, they're uh, scraping it and, you know, taking it in my opinion, very unethical way. And then they're selling it and then somebody else is buying that. And they think that that means that they can just email me like crazy. Uh -huh. Um, and then I had to fill out a online form for, for, um, this home loan thing I was looking at and I've gotten 70 plus phone calls in two and a half weeks from oh my gosh. putting, you know, from submitting this form and that's, you know, combination marketing and sales. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the ultimate bad end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, but then where do you find that balance? Because if you're in sales, you've got to figure out a way to meet new people and to talk to people. And if you're in marketing, you know, you got to figure out ways to connect with the right people and get your message in front of them. Um, so what we're really trying to do is how do we do that in a way where the person on the other end is happy that we reached out to them uh, and they're going to say something like, heck yeah, or absolutely 100% when I, even if I reach out to them cold, because what I'm offering to them is is more valuable than, than what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, cause I, I started, um, my business doing Facebook and Instagram ads and I learned under a mentor that out of, out of all the ones, like she probably was probably the most knowledgeable, but I still felt there was this, there was a lot of emphasis on cold calls there was um, these long onboarding kind of sessions. Like what have you guys done to somewhat replace that? Like that ick factor, I guess, <laughs> for lack of better words. So just to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm clear on what you're saying. You're talking about uh -huh. like through the sales process, if you're not going to cold call and you're not going to, yeah. you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Always ask for the close and push that. What do you do? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that there's, there is a caveat here that I'll say first, just because I want to be fair. I think that inbound is broken and it doesn't work for deals that are over five to $10,000, certainly mm -hmm. over 20 grand. Can you get inbound? Sure. You can. So if your business model is selling something that's under a thousand dollars, you probably need to do some kind of inbound and you know you need more of that marketing engine and you're building brand awareness and you can't spend the same amount of time with individual customers as you would otherwise yeah once you get into something where you're selling ongoing services that are you know thousands of dollars a month you have to employ some kind of sales at that point and you know if that sales interaction is really pushy if it's slimy you know if you get that feeling that this other person is just trying to push you into it. Um, you know, again, you can close deals, but there's a negative factor and you're, you're creating negative perception of you and your brand and your company every single time you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, people might overcome that because they think that they're going to get more value from working with you. But anybody that's tried to start their own business and they've run it for more than a year, you've bought something that was at least a couple hundred dollars, probably a couple thousand that did not end up providing value because the person on the other end was pushy in their sales process. Mm -hmm. They got you to say yes, you bought it, and you didn't get what you were looking for. And so 
um, for us and what we're encouraging our clients to do and what we're helping them do is how do you create that relationship up front, you know, before you ever jump on a call, how do you, how do you create that value? And so we do that, you know, there's, there's definitely more than one way to, to skin a cat, but the, the typical way people build relationships in complex B2B sales, especially consulting is they go to conferences and they go to events. And that is actually a great way <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to build rapport, you know, and you invite prospects to dinner and you get to know them on a personal level. And, and then, you know, that leads to a business conversation and there's a ton of value there. And, you know, that is a great, a great thing to be doing, but conferences are expensive. You're not always able to get in front of the right people. So you're kind of just hoping that you end up running into the key people that you need to at these events. Mm. Um, and so a method that we've found to get in front of the right people really consistently is running some kind of a show that's about what your prospects have expertise in and asking them to join you and share their expertise. And again, not as a sales pitch, but as, you know, think of it like a giant networking event that's the size of the entire planet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. anybody that has expertise in the area that your show um, focuses on, they're you're going to add value. And I think that's like the really important mindset shift that you have to make if you're going to take go with this route is me inviting somebody on a show is adding value to them. And um, if they're going to say no, it's because they don't understand the value that they're going to actually get from doing that. But people pay a lot of money to speak at conferences and be in, in industry publications. And uh, there's whole services that are focused on getting you booked on podcasts and shows to promote, you know, your book or your point of view or whatever. So when you're offering that to somebody for free, yeah. there's serious actual monetary value in in you inviting them to come on your show. So we found that the show uh having people on your show like that and prospects helps you to build that initial connection, that initial rapport. You can have real genuine conversations with people. And then, you know, like I said, sometimes they're ready to buy. Sometimes they're going to ask you, had that happen. A, a lot of times it's more just a, a, a touch point that when you do have something that makes sense, you can just reach out to them at that point because you, you have that connection. Um, so what I mean by that is if you've had somebody on a show and then say you change a service line or something happens in their business where now you really feel like you could add value, you can just reach out to them and say, hey, I think with what, you know, this change that just happened in the industry or whatever. Uh, I think we would be able to add a lot, a lot of value to your team through our services. Would it make sense to schedule a call? And you're not going to have every person that you've had on your show say yes to that. But if you're not doing that the second they get off the <laughs> the <laughs> second they get off the podcast, um, then way more likely because you've already built that warm relationship and that that rapport with them. Um, yeah, there's different things you could do too, but that's that's definitely the primary way where we've seen the highest impact for clients is is that model awesome love it uh yeah i think that's huge um uh you know to like there there's a certain point uh there's this there's this one influencer that i i follow it's like uh it's like uh rich versus very rich i forget the guy's name nicholas crown and he kind of deals with like um like mindset like uh between somebody that thinks they're rich or somebody that's actually wealthy and kind of the difference between the two is is usually this there there's a point that you get to where even though there's the value being traded there's certain dignity given to each person where mm-hmm. i feel like there even if no sale happens there's there's a value you know there's that exchange of value that over over and above like you were saying with uh with uh 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 was it do getter or uh what is the book again uh, the go giver go giver yep. um and uh yeah I, I think that's really important uh so one of the one of the questions that I love that you ask all your guests and I'm going to ask it to you is what's your secret sauce like what's that that special something that kind of makes you you makes makes you kind of sing in your particular field. Um, I have two two answers to this. One I basically already gave, 
and then I'll give another one just so I'm not repeating yeah. myself. Yeah. The number one secret sauce is just create content with the people you want to build relationships with. Mm -hmm. You're truly giving them value. And it's absolutely changed my life and everything I've done in sales and marketing. It is light years more effective than anything else because you're basically front loading the value of the content you're creating by having the conversation up front mm -hmm. rather than creating all of this content and hoping somebody fills out a form and reaches out to you. I'm literally having the most valuable conversation with exactly the person I want to up front. Mm -hmm. And then if I happen to get inbound from that same content down the road, that's gravy. But the content was worth creating because I had that initial conversation with somebody. And then the relationship keeps on going. And, you know, I've, I'm consistently reaching out to people that came on my show um, either to make recommendations to them or they reach out to make a recommendation to me or, you know, there's a network effect as you've interviewed 50 people, you know, you start getting huge residual network effect of, of doing that. So that's secret sauce number one, but I basically already just spent yeah. a chunk of the podcast talking about that. Yeah. I think something that is, uh, I don't want to say unique to me, but I think that's helped me to be successful in building those relationships is I love learning and I'm genuinely curious about other people. And so when I have somebody on the show, I really actually want to hear what they have to say. And I'm constantly learning from guests. I mean, I've gotten so many tactics and things that I've implemented. Um, I mean, recently I had uh, a gentleman named Neil Barrow on the show and his focus is events and event activation. And he, uh plug for the show. Go listen to that episode because it's great. If you go to in-person events, he's he's giving a step-by-step -step, um, proactive approach you could take to events. And that's really helped me even as I'm doing it, you know, working on doing events for us or when we're talking with clients, it's really helped me to level up. So that level of curiosity, I genuinely want to learn from the person on the other side. It's not just a transaction. And I think that comes across in the information that they share because I'm able to to pull that out because I want to know, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in learning the information. And so, um, you know, I think that that's really helped me. Yeah. Uh, you uh, like, so I remember the first time we met, um, you used to go to our church. Um, and I remember, and I, I feel like because our community groups were kind of in two different regions, we didn't get to like interact very much, but like, I just remember the conversations that I had with you with you were um i just felt like there was a deep um curiosity in me like when i was talking to you like and um yeah i definitely definitely would concur that 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 is uh your secret sauce man um so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um Wawiza, the Wawiza movement um how did that start for you guys cuz i mean i know you guys traveled quite a bit uh, in your early years, um, like how did that become something that you guys were like, we're going to do this together. And yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the name of the organization is Waweza movement and it means, um, basically enabling somebody else to give, it, um, able to give or, or enabling somebody to give. And, um, that predates me by a long, uh, a long, a long time. So I can't take credit for starting it okay. <laughs> or any of that. Um, my wife's parents started going to Kenya in 2001. Um, and she went for the, on that first trip when she was 11. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, going to Kenya and kind of being part of, of, um, serving people in Kenya has been part of her life from when she was super young. But then in 2019, she was getting ready to go to, uh, my wife Megan was getting ready to go to nursing school and she took six weeks to go spend some time in Kenya in between nursing school and uh, what she was currently doing. Uh, and when she was there, she ended up meeting these little kids that were on the street that were the same age as her little sister that, you know, didn't ha weren't living with a parent that are like six or seven years old, um, trying to survive on, you know, essentially on their own without basically without government resources. I'm not going to say there's none, but mm -hmm. these kids are essentially on their own. Um, and that really impacted her. So she came home and she was like, man, somebody has got to do something about that. And mm -hmm. my wife is awesome at being the kind of person that doesn't go, Oh, somebody should do something about that. Maybe they will. She's like, somebody has got to do something about that. I'm going to do something. Yeah. And so she came home, raised a bunch of money and built, uh, the rescue center 
and uh, it opened in 2000, back in 2011. So uh, it's been open for going on 13 years, coming up here pretty soon. Wow. Uh, and we've had over 50 kids that have been part of our program over the years. Some of them um, have been with us through the whole time. Some of them we've been able to transition back to, you know, more of a family focused environment. Um, but I ended up meeting Megan when she was promoting and raising money for Waweza before uh, the organization started. So I'm from Denver. We actually met at a conference in Denver where she was promoting it. So it's really mm-hmm. how, the catalyst for how we even met was oh, wow. from the organization. And then, um, yeah, I kind of just joined in and, and I've had the privilege of being a part of it because it's definitely been um, super life changing for me as well. Yeah, one, one really cool thing is that we were able to take our two older kids in December for the first time. And our oldest son just turned 11 or he, he's turning 11 this week. So right about the same age as when my wife went for the first time. So it's kind of full circle wow. being able to, you know, make that same connection for our kids, which has been, been really powerful. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just, I know I'm kind of monologuing here, so I'll, I'll wrap up with this. We've really, uh, over the last year, we've recognized that there's a really huge need for career training and job training. Mm-hmm especially for widows and and young moms whose kids would end up basically in an institution like what we have been traditionally running. So we're really shifting the focus. We're still working with the kids that we have now through, you know, high school and for some of them college or trade school, but we're really shifting our program to focus on job training for especially starting out um widows and single moms that have young kids and getting them skill training. So we're about to launch a program in the next few months that's um, a fashion and design program. So they're going to learn tailoring and um, we're kind of still working on it, but it's going to be somewhere between a year and two year program where they're going to go and get a cer- certification and, um, you know, really hands on learn how to run a tailoring uh, business or a fashion and design business. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we're kind of shifting towards that to go a level up so that, you know, the the moms of, of these kids are able to get the skills they need and provide for their own kids so that their kids don't end up on the street and, you know, in a much more vulnerable situation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. The kind of work that you guys are doing right now. Um, how is there, is it, is there a way for people to give, um, to, to that organization? Yeah. Um, yeah, our, our website is wawaysofmovement.org. So you can, the easiest way is just to give through the website. Sorry, I'm talking about earlier how I'm dyslexic. So it's trying to spell that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My brain out loud is always sorry, but W A W E Z A and then the word movement.org. Uh, that's definitely the best way. And we're actually in the middle of purchasing a piece of land. So we've been working off of this uh, property that we don't own that's about three quarters of an acre. And we just, purchased um and are finishing or working on raising some funds to finish that uh the purchase of a six acre property and so that's really going to long term be where our operations are going to happen out of and really provide the base for us to to be growing so um yeah if you want to go to our website and and donate to that land project it would be super helpful yeah yeah that uh that's got to be nice to have a remote job that allows you to kind of be flexible like when are when is the next time you're headed or you you did you 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 mentioned you guys are getting ready to go or did you just come back well we just we just went in december but definitely sometime in the next because we're gonna be closing on that land um in the end of april so sometime between april and december just depending on tickets and you know yeah uh schedule and everything like that uh I'm going to go probably take my oldest son again with me uh, on that trip. And uh, so, yeah, definitely we'll be getting out there again in the next six to nine months, somewhere in that range. Awesome. Um, Joseph, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Thank you for, for giving so much of your time. Um, I will put all the contact links for, for what Joseph's doing um, in the, in the show notes. But uh, yeah, man, thank you again. And, and uh, uh, check out the Outbound podcast. Uh, it's really cool. And you'll learn a lot. 
Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to connect again and, and, and meet for coffee in person. Cause it's been a while. Yeah, man. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you guys. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. All right. And I'm stopping.